Hello, guys. I <laughs> uh, hope you guys are having a good Sunday. Uh, so, my name is uh, David Cobia. Um, I am the director of technology at a company called uh, Ushahidi that is based out of Nairobi, Kenya. And I'm here today to talk to you guys about uh, crowdsourcing with Ushahidi. Um, some people might not be familiar with uh, crowdsourcing. So, uh, just to start, you know, uh, when people talk about uh, crowds, uh, usually uh, crowds just seem uh, insane and chaotic, right? Much like uh, these uh, crazy people who are running the, uh, the bull uh, in uh, Spain, they seem crazy, right? Uh, this is a crowd. And then sometimes, you know, a crowd is also, you know, um, uh, a cool flash mob in the, uh, the Hong Kong airport. Uh, this, was, this was very cool, by the way. Uh, and this was very well organized. But uh, most of the time, people don't really take crowds very seriously. In fact, um, a cynical streak in society looks at all forms of amateur participation as either naive or stupid. Um, there's a very interesting uh, project in the United States that was uh, launched by the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. Um, it was called the Network Challenge. And what these guys did, uh, this is a, a military wing of the US government. They said they launched, they hoisted 10 balloons all over the country. And they posed a challenge. They said, if anyone can figure out where these 10 balloons are, we will give them $50,000, right? And just based on the complexity of this problem, they actually said it was impossible to predict where these 10 balloons were. But as it turns out, some students at MIT solved this problem in nine hours. So how did they do this? They prepared before the, the, the launch of the event. And what they did was they reached out to people via the internet, social media, and said, we will pay you, we promise to pay you $2,000 if you can figure out where the balloon is. So they got thousands of people involved in this effort. And they even went as far as uh, rewarding people who, uh, who reported false information, because obviously some people, you know, incentivized to cheat, you know, want this 2,000. So you, you, you paid a little extra, and they solved this problem in nine hours. This is the essence of crowdsourcing. Um, I, th I think uh, you guys should look uh, this book up by James Rowicki. I think it, uh, it, it explains crowdsourcing a little better. Uh, it's a great book, The Wisdom of Crowds. So what is Ushahidi? Uh, Ushahidi is uh, a free, is a, is a company that, that builds free and open source software for information collection, visualization, and interactive mapping. We basically build tools that let people tell their stories with the tools that they have, which most of the time, in a lot of countries we work in, the tools that most people have is mobile phones. Um, Ushahidi, which means uh, testimony or witness in Swahili, uh, is something we came up with a little over five years ago. Uh, this was after a crisis in Kenya. An election went south. And what the government did was shut down TV, news, radio. And they said, you know, we'll shut down all the media until we can solve this problem, which was not the way to go. Because what happened was reports of violence, uh, police brutality, looting, you know, property destruction, all this stuff started popping up all over the internet. You know, some of us were bloggers back then. And we started to see these reports. So we said, you know, just a group of us on a weekend, Let's build uh, something simple that people can send text messages in to report these incidents that are happening, right? And that was the genesis of 
Ushahidi. Um, so what Ushahidi is, this is a platform that you know, allows people to aggregate all these disparate uh, forms of media, mostly from the internet. Uh, social media, you know, uh, all these other websites, RSS feeds, uh, text messages, pull all this into one platform, map it, you know, and then output, you know, uh, maps uh, and other feeds. Uh, and maybe it's better if I uh, uh, illustrate what, you know, if I can get this to work. So, uh, just to give a few examples of where Ushahidi has been used. Uh, Ushahidi has been used in election monitoring in India. Uh, Ushahidi has been used in Kenya uh, this, uh, to monitor different elections. Uh, Ushahidi has been used for citizen journalism. Um, Harass map was very interesting. This monitored sexual violence against women in Egypt. It was a very sensitive deployment of Ushahidi. Uh, the all spill crisis map uh, this was in the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, this was just uh, documenting the ecological impact of the oil spill and how it affected communities around the Gulf after the oil spill. Um, Ushahidi has been particularly useful in disaster and crisis response. Um, Haiti, I'm sure most of you remember this, this was, really, this was a really big event that affected most people around the world. I think. Uh, disaster and crisis in particular drive crowds to participate in, in, in crowdsourcing. So you see a huge outpouring of you know, information and help during uh, uh, big crises around the world. In fact, we like to say that um, tools like Ushahidi give the ordinary person a digital front seat to events happening around the world. Right? Um, Ushahidi has also been used for social revolutions, the Arab Spring uh, uh, in, in Egypt, uh, we've been in Libya, in Syria, um, and all the countries in between, as well as the Occupy movement in the United States. Uh, and then uh, in, in, in the last few years, the, the mainstream media has uh, become particularly interested in, in, uh, in crowdsourcing because obviously it changes the way the story is told. Right now, everyone is in and part of the. the uh, everyone is a part of the story now. So, uh, mainstream media is feeling a little left behind, so they're trying to catch up by, you know, looking at crowdsourcing tools like Ushahidi. We also build a bunch of mobile uh, applications, iPhone, Android, uh, and everything else in between. So, how does this actually work? Um, so, we're we're trying to gather as much data from the crowd, right? and then spending a huge amount of time, or as quickly as possible, using the crowd to verify this information that is coming in, and then pushing it on to first responders and policymakers and people who can actually react to this information. Um, crowdsourcing is complicated. And actually, you know, as you can see, this, this diagram, this workflow is from uh, uh, Kenya and the election, and what it took to crowdsource an election in Kenya. As you can see, you, know, you have a whole media monitoring team. You have an SMS team. You have people who spend time looking at the individual bits of data and, and looking for locations, geotagging this data. And then you have people doing analytics, verification, and uh, technology, the technology component. So crowdsourcing is work. So, uh, for instance, with uh, the election in Kenya, there were over 5,000 messages received from regular citizens. You know, 5,000 reports created, over 4,000 reports were approved, meaning these, re these are reports that we deemed to be uh, truthful in a sense. 2,700 of them were actually verified. So, as you can see, this, this is a big effort. You know, crowdsourcing is work. It takes organizing a crowd of people and making it happen. The thing is, a lot of times it's, it's not that difficult around uh, uh, specific events. So as much as we concentrate on building software, we like to think of our software as 10% of the solution. 